Riding bikes in cities is the best. It's a great, it's a great way of getting around. It's fun, it's efficient, it's good for your health. It's good for our cities, it's good for the climate. And when we talk about bike friendliness, we often talk about important things like increasing bike infrastructure, bike friendly policies, bike infrastructure, bike infrastructure, bike infrastructure. But there is one thing that's holding back bike friendliness in pretty much every city that rarely gets talked about. And it's not just that. It erodes our sense of safety and community. It fuels crime. And if it happens to you, it's really, really annoying. And that problem is bike theft. But here's the thing. There's a solution to this problem. A project out there has proven that bike theft can be solved. Well, not maybe not solved, but at least improved significantly. Like under this program, the drop in the number of stolen bikes is pretty staggering. The kind of numbers that you would think would drive this program everywhere. But it's not gone viral. This idea has been frustratingly slow to spread. And that's what this video is about. I'm Tom, and this is Shifter, a channel all about urban cycling and bike commuting. And today I want to tell you about not just the solution to bike theft, but try to give you a broader sense of the scope of this problem in the first place, because I think we've all become a little bit numb to the negative consequences of bike theft. Because in the big scheme of things, bike theft seems kind of petty, especially in a world plagued with problems like we've got these days. But as we're about to explore, I'm continually surprised by how deep and how harmful bike theft really is and how much it hurts all of us. So hold on, at its heart, this is a story about two very different guys. One is the tech icon who invented the Xbox and then had his mountain bike stolen. And the other is a veteran cop who was bored with desk duty. And it's about their big idea that could go a long way to solving a problem that we've come to accept almost as inevitable in our cities. If only their idea would catch on. This is Noel. My name is Noel Keogh. I taught for, for 15 years in the Faculty of Environmental Design at the University of Calgary and uh, very active and a co-founder of Sustainable Calgary Society, a not-for-profit in the city. Noel is one of the most dedicated urban cyclists I know. Been a bike commuter for almost 40 years in the city. The past 25 years, I haven't owned a car. That is until about two years ago when his bike was stolen. I had uh, tied it up at the Sunnyside LRT uh, to a, a sign, a city signpost. And I had left it there overnight. Uh, it wasn't something I did infrequently and didn't, never had problems with it. It was stolen by the time I got back in the morning. Then, just a few weeks later, his replacement bike was stolen. You know, it was a little bit more careful. I guess I, uh, I, did, I, I bought a better lock. I had that one for a matter of months. I stopped at the, uh, the, drug, the shoppers in Kensington for two minutes, run in, get a bag of chips, run out, and I lean my bike up against the wall and try, try to kind of keep an eye. And when I came out, it, was, it was, wasn't in there for more than 60 seconds. And I came out and it was gone. And even a few weeks after that, his bike was stolen, yes, for a third time. I actually took a couple of months to replace it after that. I was kind of shy about, about spending again on a bike and just, you know, kind of disheartened. And so I ended up buying a lower mid-range uh, new bike. So I went to to MEC and said, what's your best lock? And bought the best lock they had. And I don't think I had it two months. I have a habit of going to the Y every uh, Saturday or Sunday with a friend. So we went midday Saturday. It's a nice sunny day down to the Y in Eau Claire. Tied up the bikes out there right in front of the swimming pool. Went in for a couple of hours workout and came out and the thing had been just sawed right through and tossed to the side and the bike was nowhere to be seen again. <laughs> I remember seeing Noel after, just after his third bike had been stolen and he was so demoralized and frustrated. He was a guy who had spent most of his adult life using a bike as his main form of transportation. And he told me at the time that he was considering giving it up. I was pretty pissed and very, you know, disheartened. Why is it so easy for this to be happening in our city that thousands of bikes are being stolen and, and there doesn't seem to be any remedy for it? And this is the insidious thing about bike theft. There's an assumption that most bike thefts happen to, you know, upper middle class hobby riders who can just go out and buy a new bike. But that's not always true. Sometimes it's people like Noel who need a bike just to live their lives. And here's another thing. We don't even really know how big of a problem bike theft is because we've there's so few real studies or research has been done about bike theft. For one thing, we don't even really know how many bikes are stolen each year. 
There are some estimates that I've seen that say 2 million bikes are stolen in the U.S. every year. Some say a bike is ripped off every 30 seconds. Some estimates say that the number of bikes stolen has doubled over the past 20 years. And everyone agrees that a lot of bike thefts, and maybe even a majority of them, are never even reported. So really, we have no way of knowing how many are stolen. Here are some of the things we do know. In 2015, researchers at McGill University in Montreal published an actual research paper about bike theft. They tried to at least get some of the answers to the fundamental questions about bike theft, as they said in the paper, the who, what, where, how, and when of bike theft. Montreal is a good place for this. It's probably the most bike-friendly city in North America. It's great. You should go. It's an amazing city. So if you want to start thinking about the implications of bike theft, this is a pretty good place to start. But let me drop some facts on you from this paper. The researchers found that 20% of bike theft victims have had a bike stolen three or more times. Of those who have had their bike stolen, 7.5% don't replace it. 15% say they bike less often afterwards. And only 2.4% of stolen bikes are recovered. Just think about those facts for a minute. Pretty much every city in the world has recognized that getting more people on bikes for transportation is a key part of the future. It's great for keeping people active and healthy. It's good for street life. It can help cities reach their climate targets. Cities spend so much time and money trying to get more people to ride bikes. But at the same time, we have this problem of bike theft that is just rampant. And a lot of people who lose their bikes never replace it. We're missing those people from the matrix of cyclists. We also know that bike theft fuels crime. It fuels cross-border crime. There are the intangibles about it too. It can destroy a sense of safety in your own community. It fuels cynicism towards police and your neighbors. You know, for a lot of people, getting your bike stolen is not that big of a deal. You can always replace it. But if you use your bike for transportation and your bike goes missing, it can have a massive negative impact on your life. Bike theft shouldn't just be the cost of living in a city. We should recognize these far-reaching implications and because they hurt victims, they undermine our efforts to make cities more bike friendly. It undermines climate targets. It fuels organized crime. It demotivates people from riding. It destroys a sense of safety in our urban areas. And listen to Noel. This is a guy who loves riding his bike. I think more about, okay, is this a place I should be taking my bike? Place and a time I should be taking my bike or am I, is this going to be risky? This theft problem is cramping my lifestyle. I, I just can't enjoy this mode of transportation anymore. I want to show you something. You see the number stamped in the frame there? That's a serial number. But what's strange is that the serial number on this bike can be much different than a serial number on another bike. In fact, in some cases, that number is not even a serial number. It could be a color code or something like that. Believe it or not, the bike industry has never agreed on a standardized serial number. You could look at it like this. Bikes are the only type of vehicle in North America that does not have a standard VIN number, a vehicle identification number. Every other kind of vehicle does. I point this out not to criticize the bike industry, but seriously, come on, let's get this together. But illustrate a larger point about bike theft, and that's the indifference. I don't think individuals are apathetic towards bike theft. We are all driven crazy by this crime, especially when we're the victim or someone we know is the victim. But there seems to be a systemic indifference toward bike theft that's kind of built into modern society. And that lack of serial number standardization is just one manifestation of that. Think about your local pawn shop. I'm sure there are a lot of bikes sold at pawn shops are legit, most of them are, but if some of them are stolen, does anyone really care? Does anyone do anything about it? Think about online resellers. I've spoken to many bike theft victims who blame online reseller, resellers such as Kijiji for turning a blind eye to people selling stolen bikes on their platform. I asked Kijiji about this. They basically denied it and said they do everything they can to prevent bike theft. The safety and security of our 16 million users is paramount, they said. Kijiji commits significant resources toward the detection and prevention of activities that violate policies for posting. This includes industry-leading technology and a dedicated community support team, in addition to help from an active and supportive community of Kijiji users who flag inappropriate postings. And cities don't seem to care either. When's the last time your city spent any money trying to reduce bike theft? Yes, some cities offer secure bike parking here and there, 
but most cities can barely be bothered to place bike racks in highly visible locations, which might do a little bit to prevent bike theft. Incredibly, this indifference even applies to those of us who love bikes. How many of us don't buy a decent bike lock? How many of us don't bother to lock up a bike when we just pop into a store for five minutes? How many of us have even bought a bike used, even if the seller seemed kind of sketchy and had no backstory on the bike? Come on, some of us have done that. So when you look at how pervasive the problem is and how damaging bike theft is to society, it's crazy to me that so few people seem to care on a systemic level. But I think most of us have even come to think of bike theft almost as the cost of living in a city. But think about that for a second. Are you okay with nobody caring about bike theft? Because neither am I. Back in the late 2000s, there was an uproar in Toronto when this guy was arrested. His name was Igor Kink. He owned a small bicycle repair shop in the city, and his arrest caused a bit of a firestorm in the city. That's because for years, people in the community thought Kink was dealing in stolen bicycles. For years, they had asked police to step in fruitlessly. For years, they seethed while Kink kept on accumulating and reselling bikes that appeared to be stolen. When he was finally arrested, police say he had more than 3,000 stolen bicycles stashed around the city. The city seethed in anger at this guy who became known as the world's most prolific bicycle thief. But somehow Kink became more than just a bike thief. He was charismatic and smart, and he seemed to live by his own anti-capitalist code that turned him into sort of an anti-folk hero. At least two documentaries and a book have been made about him. But what got my attention in the Kink case can be summed up here. This is a quote from the book Kink, a graphic portrait. At one point in the book, it quotes, Robert Tajidi, a Toronto police officer who was speaking about the anger the city felt towards how this guy had stolen bikes with impunity for years. Here's what he says about the police's perspective on this. Quote, Here's the thing most people don't understand. We're busy, and that's not an excuse, but property crime is tough to prosecute. We hear the complaints, you know, that Mr. Kink deals on hot bikes, so why don't you arrest him? Well, we don't know he's dealing in stolen property. We need search warrants, and no judge will grant one based on rumor. Did you catch that? Here we have the world's most prolific bicycle thief, and police for years said, basically, there's nothing we can do about it. And this is the crux of the legal problem of bike theft. Bike theft is difficult to police. It's easy to blame police, and victims of bike theft often do. It's almost a truism that police don't take bike theft seriously. The police are busy, and I'm sure most people would agree that chasing down murderers or sex offenders is more important. It's a question of resources and priorities. It's understandable, but this creates a weird kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Because bike theft is so hard to police, people assume the police aren't doing it, If they assume the police don't care, it creates apathy both in citizens and the police. There are estimates that less than half of the people who have their stolen their bike stolen don't even bother reporting it to police. And that's usually because they think the police don't care. This also creates what I've come to call bike theft vigilantism. A couple of years ago, I interviewed uh, this woman for a magazine story I wrote. Her bike was stolen in Vancouver. She managed to find it being resold online, so she arranged to buy it back. When she met up with the seller, she got on her bike to test ride it, and she just rode away. Basically, she stole back her stolen bike. And this seems to happen a lot. In this case, her story went viral. She ended up celebrating her vigilantism. But this is messed up. Vigilantism is terrible for the justice system. It's also incredibly dangerous for everybody involved. But it's that feeling that nobody will do anything about the crime that fuels vigilantism. Also, bike theft isn't always just about bike theft. When I've asked police about this problem, they often tell me that bike theft fuels other property crime and drug crimes. It erodes trust in the police and the justice system. Also, did you know that most police services don't share information about bike theft from city to city? There's no national or statewide or province-wide database of stolen bikes in North America, which means once a bike ends up in another city or state, it's almost impossible for police to track down its rightful owner. And this fuels what some police say is a pretty rampant cross-border trade in stolen bikes. So blaming police is a simplistic answer to a very complicated problem of the ways the law deals with bike theft. I hope by now I've convinced you that we all should pay more attention to bike theft. Now I want to introduce you to two guys. This is Rob Brunt. My name is uh, Rob Brunt. I'm a detective with Vancouver Police Department. Uh, right now, I'm the liaison officer for Project 529. 
He was a street cop for 25 years, then he got into an accident and was assigned to desk duty while he recovered. The job, he said, was kind of boring. This is Jay Allard. He was once one of the top executives at Microsoft. He led the team that invented the Xbox. When he quit Microsoft, his farewell email made the tech news. And one day, his bike got stolen. It took a while, but both of these events set these guys on a course that may end up being our best hope of stopping bike theft. But it took a while to get there. Ron was bored on desk duty one day, so he went down to Vancouver's bike lockup. Best way I can describe it is, is uh, like a dry cleaning machine, uh, or like if you go to the dry cleaners, but instead of having suits and ties and trousers, it has bicycles on it. A giant mega facility where police held recovered stolen bikes while they tried to locate the owners. That thing in this video behind Brunt is a photo of the lockup. Brunt said he was overwhelmed by the sheer number of bikes that he saw being housed in this facility. Holy smokes, like how many bicycles are here? He's like, there's 500. I'm like, wow, it goes up two and a half stories into the roof. Um, and then they had another 400 bikes on the ground. I'm like, This was a time when Vancouver was one of the worst cities in the world for bike theft. 2,500 were recovered by police every year. Not stolen, 2,500 were recovered. The number of deaths was probably exponentially higher than that. At this facility, there were hundreds of stolen bikes recovered by police. But when he asked the people who worked there who was working on getting these bikes back into the hands of the owners, his answer was, well, nobody really was. Man, whose job is it to get these bicycles back? This is this is crazy. He's, he or she is way behind. <laughs> and the guy starts laughing at me. He's like, like it's we hold them for 90 days and then they then we get rid of them. This set Brunt off on a mission. He started researching how police forces around the continent deal with bike theft. And he was kind of shocked to find out that almost none of them were doing much of anything about bike theft. I, I can't find anybody in Canada doing anything remote. Like, uh, I, and then I start phoning departments and detachments and no, no, no. I, that's okay. I'll, I'll figure, I'll start looking in the States. The Americans are smart. They, you know, there's so many cops down there. Somebody's doing it down there. No, can't find anybody again. Can find the same thing. Brochures, how to hand, how to lock your bike, how to wear your helmet all that, but nothing else. He couldn't even find a shared database that listed stolen bikes anywhere. So he got permission from his chief to start looking into building a database as a first step. But he was a cop and he didn't know much about databases, so he was a bit stumped. Meanwhile, Allard had left Microsoft and was about to enjoy a mountain biking trip in BC when his bike was stolen. When he reported it to police, he was a little bit dumbfounded by how little was being done to stop bike theft. I first met Allard a few years ago when he emailed me out of the blue after reading something I'd written for the Los Angeles Times. He's a really interesting guy. He talks a mile a minute. He's really smart and he's born to fix problems. And bike theft is this thing that just seemed to hit him on a deep level. This was a problem that needed fixing. And since nobody else was going to do it, he decided that he would. He sold his vacation home and he used the money to start an online database with the idea that bike owners could upload info and photos of their bikes for free. Surely once police forces saw this database in action, they would start using it, right? Well, this is where Brunt and Allard came together. One from Vancouver, one from Seattle, one a police officer, another one a tech guru. Brunt needed somebody to build him a database Allard needed somebody who understood policing from the inside. They didn't know it at the time, but this was kind of a match made in heaven. But not so fast. The two of them quickly realized that a database alone wasn't going to solve this problem. So the two of them started on a mission. They started talking to everyone they could about bike theft. Store owners, bike advocates, community organizers, and slowly their ideas started to come together into a plan. To make a long story short, Brunt and Allard, along with a lot of help from people in Vancouver, community owners, volunteers, all kinds of people, implemented a full anti-bike theft program in the city. And guess what? It worked. Like, it seriously worked. The first year, the number of bikes stolen in Vancouver dropped by 20%. The next year, it dropped another 30%. At Granville Island, a popular tourist area in Vancouver, 33 bikes were stolen in one summer month before the program started. After that, the number fell to seven. In the years since, the number of thefts have stayed low and in some places has continued to fall. Okay, I'm going to stop here for a minute to explain something. This is the point in the story where everybody usually says something like, well, tell me the secret. What did they do to solve this problem? Was it an app? Was it some kind of GPS? 
And the answer is it was all of these things, but none of these things. What worked was a long-term community-wide commitment to preventing bike theft. Sure, the heart of the program is Allard's database, which is called 5 to 9 Garage, but just uploading a photo of your bike isn't enough. They've spent years encouraging people to register their bikes and they sell shields, which are these little stickers basically that people put on their bikes to warn thieves that the bike is registered. But they've done so much more. They've worked with bike shops to get new bikes automatically registered when they're sold. Community groups have jumped on board to relocate bike racks to more visible locations. Uh, store owners have created programs where they lend bike locks to, sh to customers who don't have a bike lock with them. Uh, there's been big education programs on how to properly lock your bike. Uh, festival and event organizers have gone on board and started providing secure bike parking at big events. In other words, the secret is everybody works really hard on a whole bunch of little things and they all seem to come together. There's no shortcut. It requires buy-in from police, from community groups, from cyclists, even those who, who hate the idea of bike registries. This is different from a car registry. We'll get back to, we'll get to this later. But the point is this works. What Allard and Brunt and everybody else in Vancouver have proved is that this seemingly intractable problem of urban life maybe isn't intractable after all. So in, in Vancouver itself, we're really rocking it. We've got it, we've got it down to a pretty good art form. Our bike theft is still, even with COVID, and all the extra riders, our bike theft is still down 40%. We wouldn't have done anything uh, and kept business as usual with bike theft in Vancouver from 2015. We were on a projection to uh, for this year to have about 7,000 bikes would have been stolen. Instead of we're at about 1,500, that difference is $8 million in one year. Not arresting more people. They're not, you know, our bike thieves aren't going to jail longer. Nothing's changed on that front. But what I feel the big difference is, is the five to nine shield on the bicycle to show that the bicycle's reg registered. The crooks know the bike's registered. They're not interested in getting stopped with it. The program proved to be so successful that Brunt's chief gave him the go ahead to start bringing the program to programs uh, in other cities. So finally, a solution to this problem was at hand. With results like this, this idea was sure to go viral, right? Who wouldn't jump on board? Well, something happened. After the success of the program in Vancouver, Allard and Brunt hit the road. They started pitching the idea to police forces all over North America and even into South America. And they had their pitch down, our Bert and Ernie routine, they jokingly say. But over and over, the same thing kept happening. They would meet a receptive member of a police force who would get excited and say he was going to take this back to the brass for approval. And then nothing. It happened over and over and over again. The receptive cop would call back a few weeks later and say, sorry, we can't find the resources or sorry, chief says this isn't a priority right now. This great idea had come up against something that was perhaps even more powerful, bureaucracy. One of the things is um, who's responsible for this? So when, when I travel with, uh, they'll be like, "Wow, is it a police problem? Is it a you know trans? Is it transportation problem? And if it's a transportation problem, is it the city or is it the you know ministry uh, or the province? You know, like everybody wants to point fingers and go, okay, you know." Jay told me recently that having the police on board is key. It's the first step. Everything else in the program falls from that. But that's proven to be the toughest part. Police forces all over the place either can't or they won't find the resources or cut through the red tape to get this program started. But you'll go to another city and they'll be like, well, this isn't a police thing. This is a bike store thing. And then you'll go to the city and they'll go, well, this isn't a city thing. It's a cop thing. And, you, you know, it's uh, now I'm now I feel like a dog chasing its tail because I'm trying to run and, you know, get another city on board. and. <laughs> Just like, wow, this this is a this is a people thing, right? Everybody should be involved. Let's just stop here and consider things for a moment. Here we have a problem of urban crime and a program that pretty much solves it. I mean, it doesn't put an end to bike theft, but it it's been proven to make a pretty significant dent in it. And all it needs to kick off really is, as Rob told me, one dedicated police officer. There needs to be a Rob Brunt in every city. One person, just one. But that is proving to be too much for so many cities. Cities can't find one person to dedicate to this. To my knowledge, Tom, I'm the only full-time police officer in Canada or the United States that focuses on this full-time. 
Personally, I find this incredibly frustrating, and I can't imagine how it must feel to be Jay and Rob, who have put so much of their own energy and passion into this. Both of them are eternally optimistic, and they say they're going to keep trying, and they are making small wins here and there. It's it's super frustrating, um, but um, but then I get to do my stuff that's local in Vancouver, and so like today, this morning, I had two recoveries where I get to talk to the owners, you know, and that's fantastic, right? Like as a as a cyclist to to phone another cyclist and go, hey, um, Detective Bro Brunt, um, you had your bike stolen? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I've got it, and it's in pristine condition. Can you come get it? Oh, you know, thank you, thank you. And I'm like, well, you're welcome, but you, you did the work. You registered the bike. Without you registering the bike, this story was wouldn't happen. It would got it would have got recovered, but it wouldn't have got back to you, and it would have went to auction. Rob has told me on a couple of occasions that his biggest concern is that Jay is funding so much of this project from his own pocket. It's not his. He's not even Canadian. It shouldn't be his responsibility to fund uh, a bike theft program. In Canada, like the government, somebody needs to step up and, and take care of this. I don't want this to sound like an ad for 529 Garage. There are other online databases out there doing good work, and you should absolutely use them. A lot of them are even linked together. There are other police programs out there. And what's happened in Vancouver isn't rocket science. It's hard work. It really could pop up anywhere. I mean, these days there are also, there are also some promising tech advances I'm hearing about. GPS-enabled bikes, Bluetooth pedal locks, better bike racks, apps. But I don't think there's a quick and easy tech fix to this problem. It takes the community working together to solve bike theft, which is also the biggest challenge. That brings me to a thought I want to share to end this video. I've been covering bike theft for several years now, and I've learned a lot that we as regular old people riding bikes can do to prevent bike theft. Buy a good lock and actually use it. Don't buy bikes that you suspect might be stolen. Register your bike with an online registry and bike advocates out there, don't get all worked up about the words bike registry. This is completely different from the idea of registering bikes to enforce traffic violations that some uninformed anti-bike people talk about all the time. This is a voluntary anti-theft online registry, much different. If your bike is stolen, report it to police. Even if you don't think they will recover it, report it. We need better data everywhere. And lastly, this might be the biggest challenge, is just to show that you care about bike theft. One of the big impediments to solving this problem is the impression that nobody cares about it. But bike theft matters. And the more of us who start to think and speak and advocate for it, the more likely we are to finally find a way to solve this problem. Thanks for watching.